99 Jams Community Matters. Good morning, everybody. It's your girl, Soup with Cindy. And live virally, <laughs> I have BSO Sheriff Gregory Tony. Good morning, Sheriff. Hey, good morning, Cindy. Good to see you. Same here. And I want all the listeners to know that you can also check this interview out because we are Zooming this interview. So there are visuals as well. So you can see our beautiful faces and hear <laughs> us while we're talking. Um, so it's a good thing. So first of all, Sheriff Tony, how have you been? I'm going to start like that because a lot going on. Yeah, well, thank you for the consideration. I'm doing pretty well. You know, this uh, has been a challenging and exciting, you know, 17 plus months since I've been in office, but it also has been very rewarding. So, you know, I, I stepped into this place and there's a lot of pressures that go with it. But for all the pressures, we, we've done a lot of good things for a lot of people. All right. So I wanted to, I, I never asked you this because I've interviewed, interviewed you before. What mm -hmm. is the difference between BSO and then Fort Lauderdale Police, Hollywood Police, Coral Springs Police? Like what area do you guys cover? Yeah, sure. So the Broward Sheriff's Office operate as the largest public safety provider in the entire county. So Broward County is roughly, you know, 1300 square miles. We have roughly 30 cities. Half of those cities um, we are responsible for law enforcement and, and fire rescue services. Other cities who have not contracted with us, they're just considered municipals. And so they have their own police department, some have their own fire department. So Coral Springs, Miramar, um, you know, Lauder, Lauderdale, Lauder Hill, and Sunrise, and a few others have their own police departments. So do you, so do you guys, when they need help, go assist them? Like, or how does that work? That's correct. So amongst the sheriff's office in all the municipals, we have something called a mutual aid agreement. So if Fort Lauderdale have a major issue that they can't handle, our law enforcement personnel or fire rescue will come support whatever operation it may be. And, it, and that's consistent with all the municipals across the county. Oh, okay. So bef before the protest, before the murder of George Floyd, how often did the police organizations, as far as the chiefs and you as the sheriff, have conversations to discuss what was going on in the entirety of Broward? Well, very frequently. So the Broward Chiefs of Police Association is comprised of all the chiefs of police, over a dozen. And they've also paired in the sheriff's office so that we can communicate. So there's monthly meetings, there's uh, shared intelligence briefings, where we all talk about the issues that are occurring in Broward County so that we can be uh, consistent in how we're doing our law enforcement enforcement practices and protocols here. Okay. And so then now since the protests and, you know, the media coverage that is not letting this die down and bringing awareness to things that the black community has already known for years, mm -hmm. how often are you guys on, on the phone and on Zooms a lot more often now? Yeah. We're, I mean, the, the tempo has picked up for sure. Uh, I will tell you, look, the protest that's been occurring out here, first of all, there's this misconception and the over- exertion of the negative that occurred. Uh, when the first protest group came out here, they, they wanted to hear from the sheriff, so I stepped out. It was a great group, uh, a couple hundred people or so. We took a knee together, we prayed together, we talked about the challenges. Uh, I reinserted the, my commitment to make sure I hold deputies accountable and bring justice and balance into this agency uh, for black and brown people. You know, I'm in a very unique position. I'm the first black sheriff in 105 years. Uh, I've, gone, I've gone through all the trials and tribulations. I was that young black kid with a knee on his neck before the stars were around my neck. So I understand all the issues that we face as black people in this country. But then I also now understand uh, the leadership uh, importance here as the administrator because we've changed so much. So it's not just a matter of continuing to communicate with the chiefs of police, Cindy, but making sure they get on, on, on board with so many programs that we've instituted since I've been here at BSO. Speaking of that, um, last time we spoke, you mentioned that most officers in all departments go through sensitivity training, but you had invested half a million dollars in, was it racial equity? Um, what is it? The racial, racial, the racial equity and implicit bias training. So that, what is that? What is that? That, that is hugely <laughs> important. So when an officer goes to the academy and they finish up, they, there's some sensitivity training in the course, but it's very general, very broad but there's nothing that specifically outlines the issues in the black community. Uh, and so I think several years ago, the county launched this racial equity and implicit bias training. 
they came over to the sheriff's office. They request under the previous administration to participate. It was denied. Uh, they only wanted like a small sample of 25,000 to participate in it. And when I heard about the program, I said, well, wait a minute. I spend millions of dollars on equipment for safety and everything else. Why would I not spend a significant amount of money on something that's fundamentally important for keeping officers from having negative encounters with black and brown people? Mm. The sensitivity training in the academies is not enough. It's not efficient. It doesn't cover the longstanding history of discrimination, um, uh, practices and prejudice that exists in America, specifically to us, to black people. So I dedicated a half a million dollars to that program. I'm mandating the training for every single deputy under my command. I'm also going to commit to match the funding for any law enforcement agency in this county that wants to take the training. So now it's going to be inexcusable for any organization not to have this type of training. But are you, know, you are you aware of like I know you did that for BSO. Are you aware of what other police departments did it? I can, I can tell you right now, from an agency standpoint, and launching this for all my deputies, we will be the first to uh, establish this type of success in getting it done here at the agency. But we talked earlier, right? Some cities have their own territories. Yeah. Well, if we're doing this in my cities, in Dania Beach, in Pompano, in Weston, in Parkland, but we're not doing it in, let's say, Sunrise or Coral Springs, that's an issue for Black people in those areas. And so... Mm -hmm. We learned about the partnerships, right? Uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, had the civil unrest that occurred over there. Well, my deputies had to go out there and respond and support them. Uh, you know, it's my contention that if we are going to have to respond and support so many different municipals here, then they need to get on board with introducing the necessary training to avoid having civil unrest. We don't want to be retroactive, Cindy. It doesn't help. Yeah. So speaking of the Fort Lauderdale Police Department, a video went viral during one of the protests that one of the officers, well, former officer Stephen Poherens, he um, pushed a young female protester that was kneeling and they were peacefully protesting his head. And then the Sun Sentinel reported later on his long history of violent arrest and things that came out later on about him. And it made yeah. me wonder because also the um, officer that murdered um, George Floyd also had a history of negative comments from the community and, and, you know, complaints. Right. What is like, there's several questions in the point that I'm making. Is there a department that keeps track of how many complaints an officer has and how many, Complaints are they allowed to have before something Dude, happens? Love your question. This is fundamentally one of the biggest problems we have in law enforcement is that we don't hold people accountable early enough mm -hmm. so that we don't have somebody being murdered on national TV with a knee on their neck for nine minutes. So to your question, what we've done here, when I came in office in January 2019, February 2019, we enacted and put in a new early warning system where we can track and monitor anybody who is starting to exhibit signs that they're overly aggressive, that they're abusive, and that they're continuing to show patterns where there's probably going to be a level of violence introduced in this community. And once we flag those individuals, you have the option to send them back to remedial training or, or to limit their type of exposures or reassign them to certain areas to safeguard the public. But that's part one of what we did. Another thing I had to do in this agency was build a use of force review board. And Cindy, what that is, is basically I have about a half a dozen subject matter experts in the agency in defensive tactics, right? Who can use what? Was it right for them to apply force? Did, did they need to take someone down, et cetera? And that use of force review board is now going across all of my cities and examining every single use of force that is occurring in Tamarack, um, or any other city that we may have a lot of everybody see. And so that's important. Then last year, you and I talked about this. Uh, we had a professional standards committee in here that was built under my, um, selected by my predecessor, you know, Scott Israel, when he was here. And I noticed that the discipline that that professional standards committee was making, was not, the recommending, was not fair and wasn't consistent mm -hmm. with the level of force being used. For example, we had that one deputy uh, Deputy Sabrino, who was beating a guy in handcuffs in a hospital. I don't know if you recall that one. Oh, yeah, in the video, he didn't know that there was a camera in there or something, and it went yeah. viral. Well, yeah. that case, the Professional Standards Committee recommended just suspending him for a few days. 
to the Duluca Roll case in Tamarack, where the young Matt Face was slammed into the ground. The Professional Standards Committee had recommending uh, exoneration, meaning totally no discipline. He was quote unquote right. And I went against every single one of those items, uh, including the, we had a deputy beat a young man in handcuffs inside the, the prison. He was fired. I had another deputy um, who was involved with fighting an inmate and, and brutally assaulted him. He was fired. So you have to take on a very aggressive approach and understand that it's going to come with backlash, right? The unions don't like it. But if we're going to gain the public trust, Cindy, we have to hold our deputies accountable or we're going to see what took place in Minneapolis. Uh, and, and to my point earlier, when I have to terminate somebody, it's already too late. The, the wrongdoings occurred, somebody's hurt, harmed, injured, or God forbid, killed. So we put in all these sensitivity trainings, we've instituted this warning system, we made sure that we create a professional standards uh, committee that's much more diverse. I end up basically firing everybody from that professional standards committee. And, and yeah, I was gonna say, where are they? <laughs> they there's an entire new staff. Uh, oh. I selected an entire new staff uh, because it's both civilian and uh, law enforcement. I brought in more minorities. Um, the employee, the committee members who are civilians are attorneys, mm -hmm. employment labor experts, and they're minorities. Quite frankly, a lot of them are black and brown people. Uh, that was unprecedented to do. But then I also took it one more step higher. I actually hired a judge, uh, Julio Gonzalez, to be the chairman of it. Judges deal with equality and balance and fairness all the time. Who better suited to be the chairman? Mm -hmm. And so I'm confident that as we have any type of controversy that uh, evolves into the public with the community, we're going to get this right. And if it's not right, I've proven it, you've seen it. I have no problems with making tough decisions and holding people accountable, even if I have to terminate them. That was, I went on to a protest in Coral Gables on Saturday and it was a peaceful protest, thank God. And that was one thing that I kept, you know, cause everybody was speaking and, and expressing themselves. And that was one thing that I said is one of the main issues is that people are not held accountable. So they think they could get away with it. And now in these times that we live in with everything being filmed by people standing by, by body cams, I hope that at this point that helps regulate what has been going on because well, one of the biggest regulators uh, is not just video cameras because again it captures the event after the fact it's leadership and and holding people accountable setting the tone for this is unacceptable i won't tolerate it and having the fortitude to fight against union representation because they are coming um mm -hmm. I've, I've had a lot of bullets fired at me this year but if not me, then who? Who's going to make these decisions to help break down the long-term racial uh, prejudice that exists within the Criminal Justice Institute? Because it's not just law enforcement, Cindy. You know, if we look at the arrest rates, minorities, always disproportionate, especially the black folks. You look at the incarceration rates in the jail, minorities, especially the black folks. It continues to, to seep its way in every aspect. And even in the court systems, the sentencing guidelines that occur are so much more punitive for black and brown people in this country. And so we can't just keep looking at this thing and say, all right, we want people to be terminated. We want people to be um, moved out of this position. But we also have to look at the long-term strategy to make sure we're just not getting involved in these conflicts. Uh, so it's much greater than just you know, the law enforcement side. Uh, we're dealing with a, a deep societal issue. You know, Sheriff Tony, the black community has lost trust in the police. That is obvious. And that's just not locally. That's all across the country. And it's basically, in my opinion, the root is that they're afraid. So what, how, I know like all these, you know, things that you're implementing can definitely help, but it's like basically erasing a, a hundred years plus of fear and mistrust. And it, go ahead. no, you're, you're spot on. Uh, you know this, but you know I've been an adjunct college professor and teaching the criminal justice courses, and I remind people, especially our white brothers and sisters out there, when they're not under, they don't understand it. They 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 want they're sympathetic, they want to understand it, but I have to remind them that black people in this country have absorbed hundreds of years of inequality, starting with us being transported and brought to this country as slaves. Mm -hmm. That was the first and most devastating aspect for us. 
where we weren't even considered to be humans with nothing more than property. And then we transitioned and fought our way out of that into a level of somewhat of normalcy. But then we ran into the civil rights movement. And the very uniform that I'm wearing was used to suppress black and brown people then. Yes. Let's not forget, it was police dogs that were unleashed on my parents and your parents and their grandparents mm -hmm. um, against protests. It was the firefighters who unleashed their fire hoses on us black and brown people during these times. Mm -hmm. And so the uniform in itself for black people is tainted. It's tainted with corruption, it's tainted with abuse, it's, it's tainted with the lack of care and concern for us. So we, we have to change the dynamics um, with the black and brown community and focus more on making sure sensitivity training is there, understanding is there, and, and we become much more you know, culturally aware of what things took place. Because it, look, we got millennials out there. Uh, I talk about the civil rights movements and some of them have no idea what I'm talking about. Exactly. And, and we can't forget where we've come from, right? So much of what we're dealing with now, Cindy, mm -hmm. is almost a time stamp similar uh, aspect from 1968, if you put them side by side, 1968 and 2020, we're dealing with the exact same issues. 1968, we were facing a huge medical crisis. We were dealing with the civil rights movement. We had a lot of conflict at the presidential level and the community was dividing. Here we are again. And how many decades later is that? You know, I'm optimistic, but we, are, we haven't made the progress that we should have made uh, since 1968. Sheriff, what, um, you know, as I, I speak about, you know, the community being afraid of police, when someone is getting pulled over, I spoke to um, Miami Police Chief um, George Kalina, and I asked him the same question, so I'm going to ask you, okay. what are your tips on when you get stopped, the best way, because what I, I suggested to him, because he didn't bring it up and it kind of, I guess he's, it's, he said it slipped his mind, but I was like, if you have tinted windows, just roll all your windows down. Like, that's all I said. Like, what Listen, are the tips? You get pulled over, now what? Let me tell you something. You know, just yesterday, I was, um, I was a speaker over at Abundant, Li Abundant Life Church in Margate, and I was talking to Bishop Thomas uh, about this, and we were talking about the differences and what we learn as a people. Uh, I was sitting down with one of my God, good friends of mine and his God kid, who's two years old, black folks. And he and I are both law enforcement officials. And we were talking about educating his two-year-old son on the basic response protocols when dealing with cops. Mm. The kid is two years old. Hmm. And we're already talking about this. And I'm the sheriff of Broward County. <laughs> and he's okay. an honorable, reputable detective in Broward County. Mm -hmm. So... The, 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 the idea that we're still having to educate black folks on how to deal with police officers before they're even two years old is absurd. But to your, your point, and I'll answer your question uh, because I brought this up with Bishop Thomas. Uh, I said, by a show of hands for those in the audience, if this sounds familiar to you, raise your hand. When I was a young man growing up in Philadelphia, I was told early by my parents that should I ever be stopped in a car, to roll all the windows down, turn the cabin lights on, and keep your hands at 10 and 2. And every black person in that church raised their hand. But not one white person did. Hmm. What does that say about our society? That the extremes of what we are learning as black people versus white people when, it when we're talking about dealing with police officers. And I still, to this day, <laughs> roll all my windows down, <laughs> turn my cabin lights on, and keep my hands at 10 and two. And I'm the chief law enforcement officer for this county. Mm. So thanks for those tips. And um, I was recently briefed that you addressed Broward commissioners this week about the efforts to root out cops who may be bad apples in the bunch. Speak a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, you know, it was part of this whole understand. Everyone's in across the country every law enforcement administrator and elected officials that represent their government are trying to figure out solutions. What do we do? What do we do? How do we get rid of the bad apples? How do we get, what's the mechanism? And so I laid out what we are doing between an early warning system, the use of force review board, the civilian um, hybrid professional standards committee, ensuring that we have a greater degree of accountability, making sure we introduce that sensitivity training with the racial equity and pussy bias training. And then also just making sure we get back into the community 
Get out of the cars, walk the communities. Last year, we launched this PWT, a park, walk, and talk program. And it's basically cops walking the beat, getting them out of their cars. I think it was in August of 2019 where I mandated that we can do this program and get the deputies out of their car. We've had between August 19th and now almost about 10 to 12,000 encounters where deputies are getting out of their car. What is that doing? It's building the social network. They're walking in their neighborhoods and they know who owns the barbershop on the corner. They know the people that live in this apartment complex. We have to break down these barriers. In addition, uh, I built out our neighborhood support teams and, and they've done a great job through this pandemic. Uh, we work with Feeding South Florida. I think they issued out over 16 million pounds of food. Um, I spent another $100,000 to um, provide 700,000 meals for everyone in Broward County. And our neighborhood support teams are doing these things. They're getting out and they're engaging with civic leaders. They're going to our churches. They're going out to different groups and saying, hey, we're here to support you. Give us what you need. Tell us what worked. And we'll get it back to the sheriff to see what we can do to support everything. When you look at all those things that we're putting in place, it's great and it's working. But we are only as strong as our weakest link. If every other city doesn't get on board with the things that we are doing, then eventually BSO is going to be supporting an agency with some form of protest or uncivil, um, uncivil uh, incident that may take place. And I don't want that either. So our time is already wrapping up. I can't believe it went that fast. But um, where can the residents of Broward County, is there a dot org or a dot something that they can go and see the progress and the things that you're working on and stay connected and stay up to date, Sheriff? Yeah, if they go on our website at sheriff.org and click on Sheriff Tony Initiatives, they will see the expenditure of funds. You know, we ended up reallocating almost $60 million last year of a current budget. Uh, any sheriff could have done the things that I've done without requesting more money towards public safety, new training center, the real-time crime center to protect our schools. We're tracking over 10,000 cameras across 256 schools, millions of dollars back into, you know, uh, project-oriented things where we're uplifting the community. And by the way, before I go, we're also creating a BSO youth development program mm -hmm. where we're going to be working with the Divine Nine. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Divine Nine is all our uh, historic black fraternities and sororities and we're going to create a program to help get people our young people off the street um, I earmarked two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that program I'm excited to see it come together in the county um, you talked about the county commission meeting the other day uh, mm -hmm. I basically pitched them on it and they were excited so I think they're going to end up either matching or at least make it a line item in our budget where we can really do this for every year to come so oh, join us at sheriff.org Join us at sheriff.org, look at Sheriff Tony Initiatives, get involved. You know, as I know, um, I am BSO uh, Sheriff Tony on Instagram. <laughs> it is me. It is not like 16 other staffers. Uh, and I do communicate when I can. Uh, look, hundreds come in um, and I do have a job, so I'm busy here. Uh, but I try to reach and touch the community. And a lot of good comments come in. Uh, people are looking to get a relationship, not only just with the agency, but with me. They want to know who their sheriff is. Uh, so continue to send those messages and stay up to uh, speed on the things we're doing. Sheriff Gregory, Tony, I want to thank you so much for oh. taking the time to speak to our 99 Jams listeners. We, I know we'll speak again because you are always a guest here. You're always invited. And just keep us connected and, and up to date with everything you have working on. I, I absolutely will. And good to see you. Same here. Your girl, Bye. Super Cindy, Community Matters, 99 Jams. Wait. <laughs>